Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the XR Sales Director Incubator, the program that helps you be better prepared for a career conversation and to make great career decisions. My name is Mike Dixon. I lead the sales and marketing practice for XR Recruitment and Search. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to, to, to today's guest, our first sales director turned managing director, uh, Esme Borgelt, managing director of Kellogg ANZ. Esme, how are you this morning? Good morning, Mike. Um... It's, uh, I just want to point out that you can take the, the sales director out of the sales director chair, but you can never divorce yourself from being in sales. So. Excellent. Well, you, you're, the, you're the first person we've had um, who's moved from sales director to managing director. We have um, uh, Ollie Tatlow on in uh, a couple of months who's done the same uh, at Reckitt. So uh, great to get his story. But I'm really excited and uh, looking forward to you know, understanding your, your journey and uh, making, making that move in particular, Esme. So um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, now, before we do, um, guys, you'll notice there's a live chat facility. Uh, for those of you on the, the live call, not listening on podcast, um, please feel free to jump on, ask questions uh, as you go, as, as it occurs. Um, I'll keep an eye on that and, and uh, we'll try and um, ask them at the relevant time. So, um, so let's... Uh, um, it's kind of, you know, as we're in lockdown, we're kind of um, in Sydney, we're kind of figuring our, our, our way, you know, through things. And I guess it feels kind of normal. We've got another four weeks to go, uh, a minimum, I think. But, um, you know, is for, for you, do you kind of, how do you fill your time? You obviously, you know, we all seem really busy on Zoom calls and team calls and, and work. But um, I'm always curious as to what people are reading. Uh, I had um, um, Adam Ballesty on last week and he was telling me about, um, you know, the first 90 days is he's about to become the CMO of Domino's. He's kind of getting stuck into that. But he also shared some of the fiction he's involved in, too. Uh, what, what's currently uh, occupying your mind? So my preference is always to read fiction. Um, and I'm a huge Stephen King fan. Uh, but right now, I started a book called uh, Bar Barbarians at the Gate, uh, which is a book uh, about the the takeover of Nabisco. Um, it was recommended by a consultant that we brought into the business who called it the best book he's ever read. Uh, so I thought that was pretty big call um, and I'd give it a go. And I think, you know, learning from private equity, how to extract value uh, without completely killing the business is, is, is a worthwhile read. So I'll let you know how it goes because I've just started it. I've, I've heard of it, actually. I've not read it, but I, I, have, I have heard of it. So, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see how you go. Um, best book ever, ever written is a big call by the consultants. <laughs> Let's find out. But uh, I, I like Stephen King, too. I've, I've read a lot of uh, his, um, his stuff. I actually quite like, you know, his older horror um, genre is, is great. He's kind of, it feels to me that he's morphed a bit more into, um, you know, off, off, you know, off the, the kind of traditional horror path and into more, um, just kind of dystopian type worlds that he, he, he gets into now. It's really quite interesting. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you've ever, if you haven't read The Stand, um, it talks about the uh, uh, ap apocalyptic end of the world because of a virus that escaped uh, a laboratory. Um, it's a chilling read now. Yeah, quite prophetic. I, I have read it. It's it's an awesome, it's an awesome one. So there we are. There's another tip for our uh, those in a live call and on the podcast, guys. If you're looking for it, it's become a book club. <laughs> who'd, who'd have thought? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and we, we we talked about you know you you you're um whilst you're an MD, you you can have your your love is with with sales. And we'll go into that, Anthony. But um, when you were young, you know, did you have kind of dreams about this is what I'll be when I grow up? You know, we, we often kind of think, oh, I'll be an astronaut or whatever. But for you, what, what was it? So initially, I wanted to be a singer. Um, and I think I may have been about 12 when I realized I actually cannot carry a tune. So <laughs> I, I had to give up my live stream at that point. And then um, at the time, we had a, a, a very big um, series on lawyers on, on TV called LA Law. Um, and I thought, oh, I want to be a lawyer, definitely want to be a lawyer. And I actually ended up going to uni um, and uh, getting a law degree, um, but never quite got there. The, the lure of, of FMCG got me in the end. Oh, really? Um, how did that happen? So... 
law degree um, to FMCG. And I know a lot of people do um, a law degree and don't go on to practice law it, 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 for whatever reason, but what happened to you? Uh, it's, it's an interesting story. So uh, when I finished at uni, I joined Kimberly Clark um, as part of the graduate uh, program. And how they do it is you do rotations through different functions in the business to really get to, to know the business. Uh, and the sales guys always looked at like they had an enormous amount of fun and they got a company car. Um, more than anything, they got a company car. And when you're driving a, a clapped out 15 year old Renault um, as, a, as a student, you know, a new car is pretty attractive. And um, got into sales uh, as part of the rotation and never left. Really? And did you, you must have tried other things in the rotation. What, what was it about sales? You know, obviously the car is a big part of it, but, uh, um, you know, what other rotations did you do and why did, why did you land in sales? So I uh, did some in customer service, in logistics. Um, way back then, things were a little less strict um, as they are now. Love driving a forklift uh, um, in, in the warehouse. So those are the kinds of things that we, we got into. From, from a sales perspective, I think the, the being in the engine room of value creation for the organization really appealed to me. Your ability to make a difference um, uh, appealed to me uh, and just started building from there. Cool. And you're, you know, you're an MD now, Esme, and is there a stage in your career where you think, actually, I could, I could do that. that that's a role... I want to go for or or does that just kind of your career evolves into that place I, I don't think I ever got to the point where I thought I'm ready I can do this um, I remember about five years ago uh, I had a conversation with one of our global HR folks and he was asking me so you know what is next for you what do you want um, and my answers to that question has always been kind of coy. So I'd always say, oh, I'm happy to go where I can add value uh, to the company and where the company needs me. And I gave him the same pat answer uh, at the time. And he actually pushed me really hard uh, and said, you know what, um, if you kind of non-committal and you, you give that kind of answer, you could end up anywhere. So what is it that you want? What do you want? Do you, do you want to be the, the, the MD for the Australia business. And I went, hell, absolutely I do. And he went, well, why don't you say so? Why don't you say so? And I said to him, well, I don't, I'm not sure I'm ready. I'm not sure I have what it takes. And he says, we can worry about that. He said, we can worry about that later. So I said, absolutely, I want that. And just making, you know, that statement that I wanted it um, opened up doors. I mean, I went on to do a uh, organization or a, um, an enterprise leadership course through Harvard Business School uh, after that, uh, did some leadership work through INSEAD Business School, all those things to help me get ready um, to take on, on this role. So I guess that's the advice I'd, I'd give everyone, you know, absolutely be humble. Um, that's that, that counts for a lot but also have the courage uh, to say what you want. And if you don't know what you want, figure it out. Because if you don't, you're never going to get there. I have, um, that's, I'm, I'm really pleased actually someone had that conversation with you. I meet candidates in my job all the time who, one of the, the key questions I ask them very early on in, in um, the meeting I have is, is, you know, why are they here? What do they want to do? And, and, and often people will, will talk about the reason that they're having a meeting with me, perhaps the, the reason that they're not uh, particularly happy in a current role or a current company. And I, there's always a push factor some, from, from a role if they're having a meeting with me. But, but, but I'm far more interested in actually the positive side of that conversation, which is what do you want to do? And, and, and you know, have you got clarity on those goals? And, and if you, um, because if you haven't, then, you know, and, and the conversation is, is simply you're having with me because you're not un, you're not quite happy with your current organization then then that's not great because you you need to challenge that organization as to um what they could do for you as well and, and what you can do for them and starting to build clarity on what that could be so having 
having a sense of um, what you want to be, um, I think it's so important uh, at whatever stage in, in, in your career. It's dead easy. And I think in our society, you know, we're, we're taught not to be, you know, arrogant or boastful or, or kind of overly confident. And, and I think that being able to kind of um, have clarity on goal setting is often seen as a bit of a kind of, you know, putting yourself out there too much. You could be cut down. And, and I, I find that really frustrating because it, it, you, you then end up without goals meandering too much and and, at the, and, you, and you're kind of you're right you know the business can put you wherever they want as opposed to what you want um yeah, so, yeah. yeah I, I think you can have clarity in in your goals and and still be be humble uh, around that i mean i, I think back of uh, i ended up spending 10 years at at kimberly clark after having joined them as as a graduate and um in, in the last year at, at Kimberly Clark, there were a few things that uh, I had in my mind. The first thing was, well, I love business, um, but everything I know I've learned from Kimberly Clark. So will I be able to be successful elsewhere? So you kind of wonder about that after you've grown up in, in a business. And then I wanted to experience another function. Now, the more senior you become in an organization, the less likely you are to take on another senior role outside of your functional expertise. But I, but I wanted uh, to, to, to work another function, just not oversee it. Um, and Kellogg's actually gave me the opportunity to look after both uh, the sales and the logistics portfolio. And that's why I actually left Kimberly Clark uh, to join Kellogg's um, because I was hell-bent on doing this logistics thing and you know it was tough but um i had a hell of a time um uh, doing it it was great fun and a massively steep learning curve i mean in sales you, you always think you know what uh, uh, tough negotiations are let me tell you negotiating new contracts uh, and labor arrangements with uh, 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 drivers um is interesting especially as a female yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, in, interesting. Back in logistics, you weren't driving the forklifts again, I'm assuming. But uh... no, no, no. I only did that. I only did that once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, tremendous. Um, I, I love that piece of advice you, you, you were given earlier on about, uh, or or being pushed by your HR um, uh, partner uh, around your goals. Thinking about advice when you look back at your career, are there particular times where someone has actually stepped in and given you advice that has really, re really resonated and helped you? Um, I think that came quite early on in, in my sales career. Um, I, and, and you know what, I, I still have um, a, a streak in me that's quite perfectionistic that I, I need to, to manage uh, a, a around that. And then when things go wrong, I tend to agonize over why it's gone wrong, what I could have done different. Um, and he once said to me, you know what, if the worst thing in the world happens today, will the sun still come up tomorrow? And I went, don't be stupid. Of course it will. And he went, well, then don't sweat it. Don't sweat. Don't sweat the, the small stuff. Control what you can control. Um, and don't stress so much about the, the, the rest. And that is a, a life lesson um, that I have um, hung on to for, for many years is control what you can control. And particularly now, as we sit in this middle of, the, of this pandemic yesterday with the extension in, in New South Wales, um, you know, a, a lot of people are uh, feeling a bit despondent um, about it and, you know, control what you can control um, yeah. and make the, the best of it is kind of the advice. Yeah, which is, which is apparently the main reason people buy toilet paper. Uh, <laughs> I read that as a psychologist said because um, you can control that stuff <laughs> so, yeah, you see, unfortunately for toilet paper they can't increase their occasions right so, so the business <laughs> won't actually grow it's just the pain that gets fuller yeah true it, it's a short term sales boost um, I, I, you mentioned earlier on you know um, you weren't sure you were necessarily ready for the M MD's role and I often um, have this conversation with people I might approach for a role and, and um, you know, where I, I look at their career path and, and, and they've not responded to an ad, but I, I'm tapping them on the shoulder to say, hey, I think you could do this. And um, 
And some are quite kind of confident or like, okay, thanks for the call. Let, let's talk. Some are like, oh, no, I'm, I'm really quite happy where I am. And, and I know the underlying reason is they don't feel quite ready for it. Um, what, what's your advice, you know, around being ready for a move, being ready for a role? Yeah, so I, I don't think that, um, oh, let me speak for myself, that I have ever been in a position before I got promoted into another role where I could con con confidently say, I'm ready for, for that role. Um, I mean, if, you, if you're honest with, with yourself, you know what key capabilities and strengths you have that you could leverage off. Um, and you need to be confident in, in those because that's what's made you successful up until where you are. You also know those areas that you, you need to, you know, focus on, on your development, whether it be technical, functional competence, or whether it be uh, from a, a leadership standpoint, and then build your, your plan uh, around that. So the conversations that um, I have in, in that space in terms of my development, absolutely acknowledging what, what I can build on, but also what I, uh, I have to learn. So I, I'm not sure the question is really, are you ready for a role? Because honestly, we don't know what a role's like until we are really in it. Mm. Um, it's probably the question to ask, are you ready for another challenge? Mm. And then what in that particular opportunity will be the challenge for you? I think if you understand that, you'll have a really good conversation around what value you can add to, to um, a new role and, and what you still have to learn. Yeah, yeah. And in that same theme, Esme, um, if, if somebody's in their role and, and feeling that the yeah. challenge of doing that role is dissipated, it's not really the same as it used to be and they're starting to feel a bit underutilized, um, what's, what's the best way to deal with that? Is it to kind of, because again, um, if, if I'm meeting somebody and, 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 they, and, and they're talking to me as a recruiter saying, you know what, I've kind of done everything I can in this role. My first question is, what does the business say, think? You know, what does your boss think about that? You know, and you know, at least on half the occasions they say, well, I haven't told them. I'm like, okay, well, you know, why not? Because um, you know, this might not be the right time for you to make a move outside the business. You need to talk to your business first. Um, what, what, how would you advise someone does that? How do they actually go to the boss and say, I'm, I'm actually a little bored or, I, you know, I need to go faster. I need, I need more of a challenge. You know, things aren't happening for me. I'm feeling, I'm feeling underutilized. Yeah, I think it's absolutely a conversation that you, you need to have with, with the business, but also stepping forward proactively and involving yourself in other areas of the business. I think the most valuable thing we can bring to the table in any organization, in any role today, is a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is being, um, you know, curious uh, about new and different things. It's about being uh, willing to experiment. It's about being, you know, putting yourself out there, learning from failures, not just about the successes. And I think that, you know, as we stretch outside of uh, what has traditionally been the confines of any particular role, the more you actually demonstrate growth mindset. And I think it sends a signal into the organization about, you, you know, the, the capability and the thinking capability that you have, but it also builds you. Um, whether you then stay within your business or find something um, outside of the business. Um, so put yourself out there to go and learn new things, even if your company haven't, hasn't uh, got, um, you know, the structures or the means to give you formalized additional responsibility or projects. Most of them do, but if they don't, there's nothing stopping you from getting involved in things for yourself and, and, and learning, you know, how the business works and whatever your interests are um, in that. I think, you know, we also need to take accountability for our, our own development and drive that um, to make sure that we're constantly feeding our growth mindset. Yeah. And is that a case of not waiting necessarily to be if the business to ask you, but actually stepping forward and saying, um, 
you know, I, I, can I get involved in that project? Or I'd, I'd love to um, help you in this area. Or, or in practical terms, how, how does that work if it's on if the individuals putting themselves forward how do they do that yeah and and be clear on why um so the conversation that that i i would suggest um would be a good one to have is i'd really want to get involved in this particular project because i'd like to learn this i would like to be exposed to uh, this um I'll, I'll give you a great example um out of uh, out of out of kellogg's as we had an H, well, we have an HR manager, a uh, really good um, HR manager, and she wanted to do a project in marketing because she's the HR business partner for marketing. And she said that her view was, I don't get them. I don't get how they work. I don't get how they think. So I'd like to do a project in marketing so that I can better understand them and be a better HR manager. So we gave her um, a, a project around, uh, we had this um, fun rotation on Fruit Loops, uh, which had uh, interesting new funky graphics um, on, on the pack. And we gave her one of those pack refresh uh, uh, projects to work with, with one of the agencies. So it took about three months. It wasn't a major thing, but she, she came back from the, that and her, her mind was completely open yeah. Uh, or eyes were open to what it's like to be in, in marketing. Um, and all came from her having a conversation saying, I want to learn what it's like so I can be better. Yeah. And I, I love that because what you, you got obviously, um, she's, she's, she stuck her hand up and said, look, this would be good. But the business has been very receptive. And I think often people think that I've had that conversation. Will it be seen as negative or I'm, I'm not content and, and, and the, the, the reality is the opposite. You know, the business is, it, we're probably, most will bend over backwards to say, great, you know, we love the fact that you're wanting to do, to do more and, and contribute because for us, we, um, that in, enables us to get a better return on you, but also potentially develop you so you could, you know, do, stay with us longer, do more things. So I think there's so many positives and I think, uh, um, you know, it's a really, a really good example. Um, um, I'd also like to talk, um, coming back to the start of the conversation about this this pathway to general management that you, you've um, you've got on. And, and um, today's session, there's a lot of a lot of sales professionals on the session on the um, on the podcast. We have a mixture of sales and marketing, and HR and and and, and general managers. We, we get a wide audience. But from your perspective, Esme, you've come up the sales pathway by and large. But which function do you think offers the best pathway to general management? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure that there is a best pathway. I think there are easier pathways than, that, than others. Because if you think about general management, it touches the entire organization. There are some functions by nature of what they are that do the same. Um, finance is, is a typical one. And I think if you, if you look at a, a lot of general managers have come up the, the, the finance path because they touch everything. I think increasingly, um, as businesses become more commercially rounded in their functions, sales have stepped to the fore because sales uh, really touch pretty much the whole organization. In fact, at Kellogg's, I, I constantly joke, and it's not really a joke, that everyone's in sales because we are, it doesn't matter what you do in the, in the organization. But marketing too, I think, you know, sometimes a little harder um, for, for, for marketers, um, unless the company is very commercial, but it doesn't mean that they can't get there, they can. I, I think any function can get there, it depends on, you know, the individual, how, how you drive yourself to get different experiences outside of um, a, a vertical and and your again your, your your ability to adopt a growth mindset I can't emphasize this enough um, you know I, I, I think in the last two years I sat on a future of work panel twice uh, and then you get asked you know what are the capabilities that you need to you know what will you need in the future to be successful and you know, blah, 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 automation, digitization. I, I think, yep, all those things, but underpinning 
everything is is this notion of having a growth mindset because if you have that you ultimately believe that yep i may not know something today but i can learn it yep i may not be good at something today but i can learn it yeah. Um, yeah. so that and that's why i keep hammering away at having a growth mindset yeah yeah i i love it i think i think it's uh massively important and for, for for me if if i'm again meeting people I, i'm I'm interested in their technical capability, of course. Are they good at what they do? Um, but you, you're, hi you're hiring somebody to do a job, but also much more than that. They're joining a business to, you know, for hopefully a period of time that they can contribute in many different types of roles. And um, so I'm interested in how they demonstrate that in, in their past as well. And, and being able to do that in an interview is interesting because um, I often find um, when, I, when I meet people who perhaps don't interview that often, they can be quite shy. They can be quite introverted about, even if they're not a natural introvert, they can be quite intro introverted about talking up as they see it, talking themselves up. And I've got to tease out this kind of um, capability and, and or growth mind, mind, mindset. Um, now you meet a lot of people too, uh, Esme. What, what advice would you give about, you know, how to showcase your skills or how to kind of demonstrate your capability and desire in an interview situation? So I think, Tell your story, um, you know, uh, particular, well, both sales and marketing folk, uh, we're very skilled at telling stories. Um, that is how we build our, our, our businesses. And we tell amazing stories about our brands, um, about our promotions. Um, take those capabilities and tell your story because ultimately what you are doing is you are promoting your brand when you're having a conversation about you. And it's not about being uh, arrogant or overconfident, but it is, uh, it is about being passionate and enthusiastic about brand you um, and, and your story. I mean, we have some of the most talented uh, storytellers in, in our industry. And uh, I find it ironic that we struggle to apply that to promote ourselves. Yeah, um, I've, I've just presented uh, uh, two shortlists this week. So I'm doing a lot of it, um, prep with candidates about um, how to get the most out of the, the interview with the, the, the client that I'm representing them for. And um, my advice is, is, is um, is very similar. It's about being able to tell your story. Um, and when you start to think of it as a story, you, 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 you also then talk to authenticity. And I think when you, when you bring in authenticity, because you, your story is going to have all the good things, but all the stuff that perhaps didn't go too, too well or not as planned and, and, you know, being able to kind of, um, talk humbly about this the great stuff but counter that with the stuff that wasn't so great but talk about what you learned back to this growth mindset then it becomes an, a, a rich real authentic narrative um which is what your brand should be because that's the reality and, and if you're able to kind of give that holistic picture in an interview then you know people remember you and your journey they're not going to remember you and all the kind of uh, just just the the highlights or, or the or the theories that you might be able to talk about because that's pretty dull honestly it's the it's the real you we're trying to get inside so i'm 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 completely completely with you there um it's an important point uh, uh mark that you make around don't just talk up the successes because no one has a life that's just that perfect and i mean it's quite frustrating when you're having an interview and you ask questions like tell me about you know, a time that you were disappointed or a project failed or you had a tough time with a co-worker and they go, um, <laughs> no, that's never really happened to me. And you're thinking, well, this is not true. Because when you ask those questions in an interview, what I'm looking for is exactly what you touched on. What did you learn? Because it's not important that you fail, that you failed. What is important, what you've learned from that and the nugget that you took away from that. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I, uh, I, the point I often make is, you know, people are very quick to tell me the result, you know, what, what, the, what they achieved, what the uplift was or the growth or share. I'm like, I don't really care, quite honestly, guys. I'm more interested in the journey about how you got there. And um, what did you do? How did you make decisions? 
um, what went wrong and how did you learn? That's far more interesting than you got a result. You know, <laughs> it's, it's uh, the result is just the, the outcome. It's, it's a process I'm much more interested in, but uh, um, yeah. And, and being able to kind of talk about the, um, you know, the, the, the things that haven't gone right. That's just the reality of life. We live in that. We, we, nobody lives in a perfect world, but uh, interesting, very interesting. Um, let's um, move on a little bit. I, I want to kind of um, spend some time as me just talking about your role as, a, as an MD and, and um, the view from the position you, you, you're in. Um, now, when you stepped into that role, was the reality different from the perception? um in any way um so <laughs> it's interesting you talk about perception because you, you, you kind of start off very early on in your career and you look at the leadership teams and the organizations that you're working for and you're looking at the md and you're thinking oh my goodness um that is so far away and these people must be so much more smarter than I am they must not they must have so many more capabilities than I do um, and then in the end when when you get to that role you actually realize that the converse is true because if you look through the organization and um, there's so many talented uh, people in in our organization that actually carries the organization a lot more than I do. And it's just the change in, in, in your, your perspective. Um, I think, you know, most leadership gurus will, will, will tell you, surround yourself with people that are, are smarter than, than you are, more capable than, than you are. And it, it absolutely is true because that is how you, you drive the, the business um, forward. Uh, that and realizing along the way that no one really expects you to have all the answers. Um, but helping folks to figure out, um, you know, what the answers are, uh, is certainly where where I get my energy from now. Yeah, great. Interesting question coming in the chat, Esme. Um, you, you spoke about the scope of control and growth mindset. How do you manage your split between thinking on internal, so team capability projects, etc., versus external factors, consumer category, customers, competitors? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's a good question because more often than not, we are guilty of being far too internally focused and not enough of inviting the, the outside in. Um, and personally, I've really gotten involved with a lot of industry forums um, because it helps keep you fresh. And then also from time to time, involving a consultant um, in, in, in the business, uh, just for, for a fresh perspective, uh, particularly for someone like me that's been um, with the company. I mean, I've been with Kellogg's for nearly 18 years now. So you, you kind of fall in love with your own ideas. You get some very fixed views on, on things. And I think, you know, some challenges um, that come our way deserve um, uh, a fresh view and someone to come and challenge some of the, the sacred cows in, in, in the business. So I, I think it's just being really um, focused on, on getting out there um, and trying new and different things, inviting different viewpoints. Um, in, uh, our, our ex um, CMO, she's now the uh, GM for for New Zealand. She always says that if you and I always agree, then only one of us is thinking. So um, invite the dissent because if you have the dissent, um, and dissent is then based on different views that come from different places, how you where, where growth happens, whether it be business growth or personal growth, invite the dissent. I, I love that. We've got uh, Tamara Howe on in the podcast, uh, um, the marketing director and give you a live session in a month or so's time. So I'm going to remember that and ask her about that. That's really cool. I love that. Um, Very good. Yeah. Um, and it's, from, on a consulting point of view, I'm always interested because if you're in a kind of more junior or mid-level role, sometimes you, you see a consultant come into the business and you kind of wonder, oh, have we done something wrong? What's, why are they here? You know, what are they going to ask me? Um, you, you mentioned there, for you, it's about giving fresh thinking. Is that the main reason that 
you know, an MD will bring in a consulting firm to do a piece of work? Yeah, that or, or to help build capability around a specific area that you don't have um, at that point in time. Uh, we used, a, a, well, the most recent example that we have in, in Kellogg's is um, we uh, identified a new uh, competitive threat and I wanted to have um, real wall gaming around various scenarios uh, with this, which meant we needed a massive download on what we perceived this threat to be and then wall gaming it. Uh, but I didn't want to do it the Kellogg way because I thought if you do it the Kellogg way, you're going to get the Kellogg answer and I'm, I can tell you what that's going to be. So we actually got a, a, a consultant in to, to help us navigate that. And uh, he was the one that recommended the, the book that I'm, I've just started around the barbarians at the gate. Um, and he was fantastic. Uh, um, and the way he did it is some of us were the competitive threat and some of us were Kellogg's and then we switched around it was pretty good. Um, so just helping with a, a fresh perspective um, and challenging uh, you. I think as an MD2, what you really need to be focused on is that you don't fall into the trap of people telling you what they think you want to hear. Um, because that isn't necessarily the best thing for, for the business. And, and consultants are normally pretty good um, coming in and cutting it wide open and laying it out there. So that's why we use them. Not often, but from time to time. Well, I guess for them, they don't have this um, history or necessarily this kind of um, risk of future. They're, they're there to challenge uh, and, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, bring, as we said, Tamara's perspective. If you're both saying the same thing, then, you know, one of you is not thinking. So it, it's, um, yeah, really, really um, uh, in interesting. Um, what um, I also want to uh, chat a bit about, um, Esme, is, is I I've been in... Uh, recruitment uh, quite a long time. I specialize in, in, in sales. I got particularly interested in, in, um, in FMCG and, and I've seen a lot of changes in, in the, the last few years. I think a real acceleration in the last five years around um, what I think is a changing role and, and the, the requirements of, of um, for instance, a national account manager or a business manager are much broader than they used to be. They, they, they almost are operating like mini general managers touching every part of the business, which is, I think, why you made the comment earlier around that starts to open up the pathway forward from sales into, into general management. Um, wh why do you think that's happening? Why is a sales role becoming more diverse? I think when you peel business back to its, its very basic form and you get beyond the products and the brands, um, if you think what sets one business apart from another, it's your ability to solve problems. Whether you're solving a problem for a consumer, whether you're solving a problem for a customer, that's what sets you apart is your ability to, to solve problems. And I think that's where sales play such a critical role in driving sustained competitive advantage with customers and customers are begging for it. Help us solve these problems so we all grow our, our businesses um, and, and that's at, at the absolute core of, of what we do and why we're seeing this acceleration, why you see really strong partnerships developing um, with some customers and why others remain very transactional. It comes down to your ability to solve problems um, for for your customer, yeah. which grows your business. And, and what I, what I I think is a challenge therefore going forward is is the is the evolution of that of the function uh, happens you know th there is a, an intellectual engagement a problem solving component that, that, that touches every part of the business um, sales in particular is, is I think become a much richer function and and um, I see more diverse skills and more diverse people uh, it's not just the, the, the space for your classic relationship developing extrovert, you need a whole range of people in that sales function to perform. Um, but I also see a challenge because we don't necessarily um, attract um, the same number of graduates in, into sales or, or FMCG sales in particular. Um, a lot of graduate programs 
that, that you might have gone on at Kimberley Clark, they don't exist anymore. So what do we need to do? How do we actually, you know, um, ensure that we are, we are grabbing talent and, and bringing them into the function as opposed to scratching our heads and wondering why we're finding it so hard to recruit, you know, a great national cap manager, whatever the case may be, because the, the, the talent flow has decreased. Yeah, so I think increasingly, particularly if you if you look at the makeup of our workforce today and how it's changing, with an increased participation of millennials um, and then Gen Z coming after that, um, it's no secret that for for that cohort, um, increasingly they care what brands stand for, they care what companies stand for, so comes back to purpose um, and the, you know, they expect you to make a positive society or drive positive societal change, lean forward in difficult conversations. And I think us as an, as, as a, as an industry from an FMCG standpoint, have got a huge role to play um, in, in addressing some of these things. And then telling the story around that to become a really attractive workplace um, to build your, your career. For example, um, our industry is at the forefront in, in working now to solve uh, the issue around soft plastics, which is a, a key pillar of, of a more sustainable future. Um, it's not an easy one for us in, in Australia to, to get after. So some of the best and brightest minds of, of industries working on, on that now. You saw the example uh, uh, coming from Nestle with a Kit Kat wrapper um, a, a, a few weeks ago. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing all of this up is, is because we do really groundbreaking, exciting things in our industry um, which is grounded in purpose, grounded in the fact that it's the right thing to do, creating a more sustainable future, not just for ourselves, but for generations to come. And if we can tell those stories um, and bring it to life, and there's no reason why we can't, I think we will become a lot more attractive um, for for graduates to, to consider our industry um, as, as a great place to, to build their, their careers. I also think that increasingly um, you will see roles blur. There's not going to be these black and white, this is sales, this is marketing, this is r and I think commerciality will underpin all roles um, within the business. And I think the breadth of role that we can offer is probably a little different to, to some of the other industries um, and will increasingly become so. But purpose, I think, is, is where the, um, the future of our industry lies in terms of making it more attractive and talking about it. That big picture of thinking around purpose or around um, blurring of roles, and, and, and it's really interesting. I, I, as an MD, Esme, you're measured, I guess, on hitting your numbers, you know, month in, month out, quarter in, quarter out. When you've got that big picture thinking running alongside it, it doesn't necessarily give a return or um, impact positive for your P&L in that trading period. C can, you, can you kind of stand in both camps? You, uh, how do you kind of manage that uh, ability to think about those broader issues, but still knowing that some of those decisions you might have to make about broader issues don't necessarily positively impact your, 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 your performance in the short term? Um, I, I think in the short term, if you talk, that will it change this month's uh, dial on, on the sales result? Uh, probably not. But over time, just like you build equity in brands, you build equity in, in, in your proposition. Because if you, if you don't, uh, what will happen is your business will erode um, over time, um, as, as it stands for, for nothing. So I do see it as, as a long-term investment. We um, invest in that. Uh, um, we do have KPIs that actually measure the return to the business, but it happens on a longer-term uh, horizon. Some of these things uh, will become hygiene factors um, uh, in time. Yeah, um, right. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, um, uh, there's just one more question come through, which I want to just uh, take a second to look at. There are, are major macro trends starting to significantly alter our traditional retail landscapes. 
uh, e-com as an example, what role do you see um, uh, an importance of disciplines like category leadership now and in, in the future? Yeah, I, I think category leadership goes back to, if you peel it back to its most basic form, is helping retailers solve problems in, in, in the category and driving overall growth so that everyone, uh, um, you know, wins through through that. And I think that is going to... to well, it is true for marketing, it is true for sales, it is, it is true for, for, for category. Our ability to drive growth, but true organic growth is, is what will set us um, apart. And in order to do that, bringing it back to the macro trends, you absolutely do have to have your consumer at the heart of everything you do and invest in, in those insights. I think more than anything, the data and analytics piece um, in, in our business is is, is where it's at, because whether that be then e-commerce, digitization, or whatever else, it all comes from having those insights that then drive the decisions and the actions that you take um, going forward. And that's certainly where, where I'm driving the organization's investment at the moment is um, uh, anal uh, analytics, data and analytics, yeah. really important. Yeah. Changing our, changing our world. Esme, we're, we're um, slightly over time, so we're going to have to wrap it up. As always, I wish we had another 45 minutes to, 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 to talk, but thanks so much for giving us your time this morning and sharing a bit about your, your journey, and, but, but in particular, the, the, the insights you have in, in, in your role, a, um, a sales director with a love for sales who who's, uh, sees everybody in, in, the, in the business uh, as a salesperson, but running a, a really successful business in, in, in Kellogg. So, been, uh, been really interesting talking with you. So thank you very, very much. Um, guys, um, to keep everybody entertained, uh, particularly those in Sydney in lockdown, we, we, we keep the content flowing. We're actually going um, again next week with a, a special kind of sales and marketing crossover uh, episode. Um, my guest will be Michael Rowe, who's the sales director of Sellies. Um, Michael's a, a 20 year marketing professional who's who, five and a half years ago as a, as a marketing director of j, &J. Uh, move to the sales director of J&J &J, and we'll explore how and why that happened and, and what perspective leading both functions has given him. Um, now today's session with Esme will be up in the podcast, Your Future in Sales and Marketing, uh, next week. Uh, download from Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Um, and I'm delighted that uh, um, so many people are, are enjoying and getting value from the content and, and the podcast numbers are just increasing weekly. So that's great. But uh, do feel free, let your colleagues know um, all about us. You can't get this content anywhere anywhere else. Um, Esme, thanks again. Really enjoyed the, 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 the conversation um, and hopefully see you all next week at ATM. Have a great Thursday, guys. Thanks, Mark. Stay safe, everyone.